I'd like to uh, first uh, thank uh, Professor Kuroda and Professor uh, Dubeyrod uh, for a uh, kind invitation to uh, this uh, workshop. And it is a great opportunity for me to uh, uh, speak in front of distinguished uh, scholars. So today I'd like to uh, talk about uh, various forms of uh, money use in early modern India. I, uh, there's a slight uh, change in the title. I first said various forms of exchange, but then I was thinking, but what is exchange? Then I avoided the uh, question and I said various uh, forms of money use in early modern India. And I also wanted to talk about how uh, money works, not only in the market exchange, but how money was extremely important in uh, defining socio-economic and political relationships uh, in India in 18th century. So um, I will first uh, describe, maybe many of you know more than uh, uh, me about the monetary system in Mughal period. Uh, the, I, I am dependent um, um, on secondary sources, on, uh, on information on the monetary system in Mughal era. And then I will talk about how there was a, a intense monetization that took place uh, in 18th century India, uh, uh, including diversification of money forms. And then I take up uh, examples uh, from the field of mine in Orisha in eastern India, uh, um, where I got palm leaf scripts from which um, uh, I got uh, um, uh, uh, records on uh, what I call a uh, system of entitlements and the, um, the kind of exchange system between the locality and the kingdom. So the, uh, the function of uh, cowries and silver coins were very much important there. Okay, so um, let me first uh, talk about uh, you know, uh, the very framework of our workshop, uh, main, namely uh, Kuroda-san's formulation of of uh, quadrants of uh, exchange. Um, I appreciate this uh, uh, framework as a very apt uh, framework for, uh, for comparative studies. And it is also very useful and relevant for explaining the existence of diverse forms of money in early, also in early modern India and in other uh, parts of the world. However, I have two reservations uh, regarding um, this formulation. Firstly, the explanation of the distinction between large money and small money in terms of the degree of distance does not sufficiently take into account into the existence of more very, very diverse forms of money. You know, it's not only the, uh, you know, whether a coin is large or small, you know, that matters. But uh, uh, Kuroda-san himself talks about currency circuits in which uh, there are multi-layered uh, market. Uh, so the function of the currency cannot be discussed without taking into consideration the particular socio-economic context, the combination of particular commodity, coins or money, and the people involved. I, I think that defines uh, 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 currency circuits or ex exchange circuits. So it is very much uh, socially contextualized. So it's, it is not only the uh, size of denom denomination that matters. And this leads me to, well, you know, same thing, so I'll go. Secondly, um, the, so well, I talked about the importance of social factors in considering the uh, nature of money in market exchange. But then, you know, there are other uh, spheres in which money was used uh, in early modern India, as, said, as I said. So um, in the non-market spheres, money was used not only for payment, but also as gift. Again, in my later talk, I will say that you cannot really distinguish between uh, payment and gift. You know, that is very much in continuity. But you know, let me simplify my uh, argument now and say that there is a non-market uh, sphere in which money was used as a gift. And uh, uh, they know each other in uh, communities or in uh, exchange between kings and the subjects. But, uh, of course, bills of exchange or bookkeeping could not replace money in these spheres, including tax. Tax cannot be paid in forms of bills of exchange uh, in India because tax was about uh, gift giving also. 
so people send gifts in order to establish, confirm, and represent their socio-political relationships because they are familiar with each other uh, in terms. So uh, what I'm saying is that uh, in uh, Kurodo-san's formulation, uh, if you are familiar with each other and you want to keep the relationship, we will uh, go to bills of exchange or uh, uh, bookkeeping, but this is not the case here. Okay, but uh, I'd like to again say by emphasizing the importance of social factors, I want to distance myself from the old dichotomy between market economy and non-market economy that was very prevalent in economic anthropology or uh, old economic um, history. Monetization does not necessarily bring about the tra transition from multi-centric economy or multi-layered economy or, um, well, to unicentric economy where all diverse form, uh, forms of money are integrated uh, into one. So uh, I agree with Kurodo-san's formulation. Uh, um, there are multiple forms of money, but not integrable. So 18th century India retained its multi-centered character, maintaining pluralities and heterogeneity, while its diverse spheres and th circuits thrived in connection with each other. So they are concurrent and connected, but not integrable. And uh, this was possible, you know, there was an interconnection of diverse spheres precisely because there was, or there were forms of money that connected to these diverse forms, which led to uh, vibrancy of economic activity, social activity, and penetration of the early modern state's administrative power into localities. So money played a very important role in forming early modern situation in India. So there was hybridity of market and non-market institutions which supported uh, each other. Each other meaning uh, market exchange, local community relationships, and political, political relationships. Now, uh, let me quickly uh, uh, talk, uh, firstly talk about uh, early modern India, uh, market and the state under the Mughals. And as you know, there have been a lot of uh, discussion about uh, to what extent the Mughal power penetrated into the log localities. Uh, someone like Jeff Richards has emphasized on the, uh, the power of the Mughal Empire, which integrated whole uh, society and economy into one with its very unitary currency system. And uh, the power to extract uh, tax was uh, uh, one of the highest in early modern states in India. And uh, the, uh, on the other extreme, not well, Jeff Richards, uh, is, I, I wouldn't like to call him an extreme, but uh, uh, Bertenstein is certainly uh, uh, on the uh, one extreme side. Uh, um, um, <coughs> emphasizing on the segmentary characteristics. Uh, the kingdom only held a ritual authority and the real power lay in localities. Uh, so he's denying uh, the integral aspect of the early modern state in India. Um, there's Irfan Habib, the great historian of Aligarh school, who also emphasized the importance of the uh, political centralization of the Mughals, etc. Uh, so, um, as we have already discussed, and as you know very well, there was a unitary currency system under the Mughals, but it was in open system, which means the quantity, or whoever could bring the metals to the mints and uh, they could uh, mint, uh, the, uh, make the coins. And uh, so it was up to the market uh, to uh, decide how, ma how, how many of uh, which uh, coins they wanted to uh, mint. However, if we uh, emphasize too much on the importance of the Mughal unitary currency system, then uh, I think uh, we will uh, uh, fall in, uh, we'll make a mistake. In the south of the subcontinent, beyond the Mughal rule, there were different regimes which produced their own currencies, mainly in the form of gold pagodas and fanams. Fanams means small uh, coins. So um, deep, and there was a, you know, very much a vibrant economy in South India beyond the Mughals. So deepening monetization and economic vibrancy in early mon early modern India were not 
totally dependent upon political centralization by the Mughals. Uh, this is a, a map uh, by uh, uh, Frank Perling. So um, he, he, he divided uh, um, early modern India to North India, middle Deccan zone, intermediate zone, and southern gold zone. And you know, so there is no real um, you know, um, integrity in terms of currency system in the subcontinent, but there was uh, still a very much a vibrant uh, interregional and local economies, international um, uh, economies taking place. So we cannot say it's only the Mughal uh, system that supported the 16th century, 17th century uh, uh, vibrant economy. Okay, so um, because if you emphasize too much on the Mughal system, then you, have to, you will have to picture 18th century as a very dark period in which the Mughal uh, system collapsed. But this was not the case. The, there have been uh, uh, revisions of the 18th century in India, and now we know that the 18th century was uh, with a very vibrant economy, development of uh, early uh, modern uh, state apparatus, etc. So the decline of the Mughals did not lead to degeneration in regional and interregional inter economies. So the 18th century was a period of expanding trade. It was not a dark age, as uh, all the imperialist or nationalist historians used to describe. So, um, but uh, then, there is a new question that we have to ask. Okay, if the 18th century was with economic vibrancy, but we also see there was a, certainly a breakdown of unitary system of the Mughals, and there was a, so much diversification of um, coins and money. So how was it possible to have both what looks like a chaotic diversification of money on the one hand and the uh, uh, connection of vibrant local and uh, uh, interregional and global economies taking place in India. So, and uh, I, um, I like to suggest, you know, taking the uh, framework from Kuroda again, that, you know, the, the diverse and multi-layered uh, currency circuits themselves uh, were very important in understanding how different sections of people who uh, 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 are in the villages or in small towns, you know, they increasingly came to participate uh, in the uh, economies. And uh, uh, so I'm saying that there are diverse social groups uh, which um, started, who started using money and uh, started participating in the uh, different exchanges. Okay, so um, we see, uh, I, again, I'm quoting from Perlin, some examples, uh, like a rice from Bengal uh, was bought by Karis from the Maldives, cotton from Nagpur, Audo, and the Upper Ganges. Uh, you know, they are all uh, exchanged um, in uh, international and national trade. And here, uh, the world of small currencies was uh, very important and uh, uh, the use of small currencies such as copper coins and carries played an important role in this process of connecting localities with polities and larger market. And uh, in Bengal and Orissa especially, Kauri uh, played uh, especially, particularly an important role in monetization of localities, uh, including tax. And along with cowries and copper coin used for small-scale transactions, there was the myriad small-scale credit letters in cash and kind. So uh, uh, it was not only small monies, um, big money, but also other uh, uh, forms of bills of exchange and the bookkeeping that played a very much important uh, part uh, in connecting uh, various uh, local economies to the big uh, nexus. So, uh, thirdly, so the deepening of monetization led to more diversification in the forms of money that were circulated. 
in order for many kind of people to participate uh, in the uh, larger economy without being absorbed totally, you know, as a homogeneous uh, population. And uh, so, uh, so I'm saying that, you know, um, while maintaining their social economic distinctiveness and still participate in the connect, uh, connected wider market, they needed their own currencies. You know, that's why the deepening of monetization and uh, also coincided with diversica diversification of money. Uh, so high quality minting, minting continued, but also a great variety of poorer quality silver and copper issues. Um, uh, um, this is a quotation from Sinha. In 1773, there were circulating in various parts of India 139 kinds of gold mohurs, 61 kinds of gold hums or South Indian coins, and 556 kinds of silver rupees, besides 214 kinds of foreign coins. And on top of this, we have many, many more thousands, literally thousands of uh, kinds of uh, copper coins, oh, cowries was one, but uh, many kinds of copper coins, what, what uh, Perlin calls gimcrack uh, uh, coins. I want to, yeah, I brought some uh, examples, actually. Uh, yes, um, I'll just, uh, so, well, in this there are cowries, many of you know already. But, um, you know, without, uh, just out of curiosity, when I first visited Kolkata, you know, these coins were on sale on the street. So I pick, just picked them up, and uh, you will see that, you know, these are small, uh, they are really gimcrack cheap uh, copper coins. And then, you know, there are many uh, copper coins. Uh, they are all made by uh, East India Company, but, uh, well, you know, as we are talking over lunch, uh, I will uh, dispute them. You know, um, uh, East Indian Company very much uh, took advantage of the indigenous administrative and monetary system. They have copied everything, including the gimcrack uh, uh, coins. And this is a Japanese um, government uh, military coupon. Uh, <laughs> I was talking about this yesterday. Uh, when I went to a recent village, you know, there are, you know, people uh, uh, who went to Myanmar during Japanese occupation. And then they said, oh, I'm seeing a Japanese person after 45 years. And the next day he brought uh, this money to me and said, can you exchange this? <laughs> 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 so, but I exchanged with one person, but then next day many more came. So I said, no, no more transaction. <laughs> anyway, so please. Uh, Face value. Um, face value would be like this one yen, which is like, you know, I don't know, half. Okay, anyway, so, uh, I mean, um, yeah, so there was a diversity of money uh, up till uh, 19th early 19th uh, century, and uh, uh, these are actually from early 19th century, so uh, East India Company kept on uh, uh, reproducing the diverse uh, forms of money uh, in India. So what was the utility of such variety? Is it simply an indication of confusion and inefficiency in the market? Uh, many economists used to believe that, but now uh, with you know, new theories like uh, Krodsant, uh, we are seeing that you know, diversity has its own value, complementary uh, the values. So yes, and uh, here I would just uh, you know um, um, endorse uh, uh, uh theory about particular exchange circuits, and I think this fits very well with Indian situation, with many castes, with many merchant groups who produced their own coins, uh, who uh, and uh, engaged in particular uh, uh, trade. Um, again, from Singha, actually, Krodsan has already um, quoted from this, but um, um, in Dinajpur, for example, sonats were used for rice and grain, and the English and French arcots for ghee and jaggery, and the French arcots for hemp and uh, ganis. In Gorakhat, sikkas, sikka rupees were used for rice and other grains, chickpeas and coconut, French arcots for cloth, 
salt and betel nut, murshida bad sonots for sugar and jaggery. So each particular coin was connected with particular commodities and with particular merchant group. So um, there was diverse coins for complexifying and differentiated economy in which there were specialization of uh, merchant groups to a, uh, a particular uh, exchange circuits and with particular uh, commodities. And this suited very well to the very diverse uh, social uh, structure of Indian society. So in this way, diverse coinages were adapted closely to the needs of a complexifying, increasingly differentiated economy, satisfying both local and long distance needs for circulating coin. Um, I will not uh, explain this because you know very well about uh, Kuroda san's uh, formulation, so, but I, I, I just want to endorse that it, it fits very well with early modern Indian situation. However, uh, now I want to talk uh, that uh, uh, this, uh, as, I, as far as I understood uh, reading his uh, previous paper, uh, you know, his uh, idea of currency circuit was really about market exchanges. But uh, reading uh, Kurosan's uh, paper for this conference, uh, I am now seeing that he's extending uh, his uh, uh, formation towards uh, um, social uh, relationships as well. And I want to push this uh, further with my uh, uh, materials. So uh, the extent of monetization in early modern India was not limited to market exchange. Multiple non-market organizations, namely local community and kingdom, where monetization played an important, uh, 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 there also monetization played an important role. However, this um, monetization of administrative system or even local uh, caste system did not mean you know, there were born free uh, people with choice, no. Um, these people were still very much indeed embedded in that social political logic where uh, it resisted the kind of uh, 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 impersonalizing logic of, uh, of the market. Uh, there was uh, uh, this uh, social political logic, logic of uh, organization which resisted a commodification of relationships. So the permeation of money enabled the connected and the concurrent coexistence of market, community, and the polity, thus allowing further connection of diversities. So it's not only diverse social groups which came to be connected, but also different kinds of social organization which have different logics that also uh, got connected with uh, money. So let me um, um, uh, explain uh, to you about what the system of uh, what I call the system of entitlement is uh, in local society in uh, Orissa. Uh, well, you know the similar uh, systems are found also in uh, Maratha uh, region and also in South India. We, we are yet to have um, uh, sources from North India. Uh, we don't know why. Uh, but uh, in any way, uh, uh, if we can generalize you know, that, uh, about the system of entitlement, so um, the rights and duties of uh, members. The, can I, yeah. Yeah. So the rights and duties of members in local communities. Uh, were prescribed by what I call the system of, of entitlement. So um, there are like a village head, accountant, soldiers, potters, carpenters, cleaners, and, and uh, even shamans uh, who get possessed by local goddesses. They were all given entitlements to receive a share of local product. And this was defined in Kauri monetary terms. So this is what is uh, extremely interesting for me. Okay, so quickly, so this is a state of Orissa in present uh, India, and the uh, Kuruda Kingdom was a small kingdom, but uh, it was uh, it had a, 
uh, many feudatory uh, kingdoms uh, under it. So Kurda kingdom was uh, the uh, king who claimed to have the highest sovereignty in Orissa. But in real terms, it accepted the suzerainty of the Mughals. And uh, so uh, the, the Kurda kingdom was divided into a uh, smaller district. And uh, this is a Goromani tree where I did uh, my uh, field work and uh, historical research. And uh, Goromani tree, Gor uh, actually means a fort. So it's a fort of Mani tree. And in Kurda kingdom, there are many forts which functioned as uh, the centers of military, administrative, and cultural uh, um, uh, units or centers uh, for integrating localities. And uh, these are the uh, palm leaf scripts I worked with, uh, and uh, they were um, kept in bundles and worshipped uh, during a Dasahara ritual. And uh, when I first requested, they said, no, 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 this is very holy. You cannot uh, open it, touch it. But with uh, four years of convincing the <laughs> person, I finally got it. And then, but there are so many uh, palm, leaf, palm leaf scripts from 19th century, but I only uh, very luckily uh, got uh, one uh, bunch from the 18th, late 18th century. So these are the uh, examples of administrative records uh, called Bihano. And uh, this is, uh, they are from late 18th uh, century. Okay. So, so-called entitlement holders were the uh, uh, legitimate members of the community. And they were given tax-free house land, and they could um, participate in community rituals and uh, received privileges and titles according to their office. In, but also in the local community, there were outsiders who paid high rent to the community for their residential and agricultural land. And we used to understand them as merely a, a sign of hierarchy in the agrarian society. But now we are finding out that actually these outsiders are mainly merchants. And uh, 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 those people who um, were engaged in cloth production, cotton carders and uh, weavers, etc. So uh, now we are seeing these outsiders. They are outsiders from the agrarian local community point of view, but they are the very person who connected the agrarian communities with the outside market. So they are extremely important. And uh, uh, we see also that there is a penetration of state bureaucracy into the local community. So uh, while there, there was a, a principle of sharing of the local products to different entitlement holders, also the state collected tax and then redistributed the uh, tax in form of uh, salaries, uh, etc. Okay. And uh, uh, also importantly, some entitlements like uh, uh, entitlement office of the village head or the office of the scribes became uh, commodified, alienable. Okay? But what is interesting again is that although these offices became saleable, it did not mean that it became um, detached from personhood altogether. The person who bought this office of a village head, for example, he would be given the uh, privilege in the ritual, and he, he will be uh, uh, donned with uh, sari, uh, cloth, around his uh, head uh, by the king or the king's representative, you know, giving him the kind of personhood you know, who, who, who takes uh, charge of that role you know, uh, as a person. So it, it's much more than, uh, this, so this, uh, uh, although, uh, so I'm trying to uh, tell you the hybrid character of this commodity. It was commodity in the market, but yet again, it uh, also held kind of a personhood in that office. And uh, yes, uh, I already told you that you know these uh, um, uh, the value of land, goods, and services were all expressed in the unit of cowries for administration and accounting purposes. This shows the degree of monetization within this area, as well as the extent of, extent of the accounting and the recording technology of the state. And actually, uh, when we look at the 
terms, um, uh, they coincide with uh, 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 Maratha, Mughal, and some Persian uh, terms. So uh, probably you know, there was an uh, early modern connection of uh, state technologies from West Asia to East Asia, you know, very remote uh, area in East, of East uh, India. Okay, uh, I, I have no time to go into details, but there, the resources were allotted to uh, different uh, uh, entitlement holders. And uh, what is it? Uh, I want to um, stress my point that although monetary terms were used, this did not make the exchanges anonymous. You were very much in the local community. You know each other. But... Because these entitlements were expressed in cowrie terms and recorded, they became rights above personal relationships. Okay? This is very different from Japanese situation, where in agrarian communities, you are very much embedded in personal relationships. You have your uh, patron, and uh, you have to be nice to him, subordinate to him. So these uh, um, uh, landlords, peasants relationships are very much personal relationships. But in India, this was not the case. Because these were entitlements, another person could come and take that entitlement. You know. so, uh, so this is a very, again, interesting situation where uh, there was a kind of disembeddedment from personal relationships. But once you have that entitlement, then you are again embedded into a personal relationship. So I think Kauri has uh, 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 the money, the place of money, and the uh, uh, expression uh, of the entitlement in monetary terms uh, helped to objectify and consolidate each right independently of personal relationships in the community. So I think this expresses uh, one interesting aspect of Indian agrarian uh, relationships. And... Uh, um, uh, what time did I begin? 20, 15 minutes past, or? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, over 20 minutes, yes. Okay, oh, over 20 minutes. Okay, good, that's uh, saved. Yes, but uh, again, okay, so um, uh, there's a marriage circle in which kauri money was translated into gold and silver ornaments, and they were given with the bride to the uh, wife receivers, okay? So uh, what I'm suggesting is that also every day, you know, eating, uh, buying, etc., were dominated by the cowries. When it comes to another, what we call sphere of exchange in marriages, then this uh, money forms had to be changed into the different valuable metals: gold, uh, silver, and uh, brass, um, etc. Okay. And, uh, um, and money uh, was also very important in defining political relationships. Um, so, um, again, I said uh, the resources were distributed within the local community, but then the kingdom took the tax. And uh, there were very minute tax exemptions and different tax rates specified for each entitlement holders. So this was very interesting. Who got uh, how many percentage of tax uh, exemptions, etc. You know, so I think this shows that you know, there were very particular forming of political relationships be between each office holders and the kingdom. Of course, tax exemptions represented uh, uh, royal privileges. And uh, what is very interesting, again, is that uh, the tax was taken from the locality, but one-third of the tax was used in the locality as well, in the form of gifts. So I cannot, again, go into details, but uh, in uh, each ritual occasions, there will be gifts from the uh, royalty to the localities, like uh, in a famous uh, autumn goddess uh, festival, uh, sheep, goats will be sacrificed in the name of king, and then the uh, money for the sheep will uh, uh, be paid by the king. But actually, uh, these are the money collected in the locality. So they are collected, again, redistributed. And then, uh, and the, uh, what is interesting is the new regnal year. Um, gifts of money, uh, in silver coins and cloth were given by feudatory kings as well as 
uh, these uh, chiefs in uh, forts. Uh, so monetary gifts in forms of silver coins were given to the king, and then again it gets translated or uh, transformed into gold seals uh, in the royal palace. And then on the royal uh, on these golden seals were engraved the the regnal year and the uh, lunar calendar. So uh, so this is a kind of symbolic transformation of uh, local uh, social system onto into the royal sovereignty. So um, again here, um, uh, transformation of cowry silver into gold represents a political relationship. Um, well, you know, I, I have given you, uh, I have sent you papers, so I cannot uh, go into details, but uh, 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 here for gift of silver coin at the new regnal year, onko beti. Onko means the regnal year, beti means meeting with king, and tonka, <laughs> Uh, as you know, perhaps is a, a, a term, a monetary term in Mughal uh, period. So 16 rupee was uh, uh, given um, in silver coins uh, to uh, the king. And uh, the, these are the details. Uh, I, I don't have time to go into details, but you know, in all these uh, um, palm leaf scripts, you know, all details about who gets how much for what job and uh, uh, the state took uh, how many percent, etc., cetera, uh, and uh, et cetera, okay? So, and so besides tax on the entitlement, uh, of course, the state increased access to merchant capital through trade tax and selling royal shares of grain in the market probably played an important role in the royal treasure, treasury. And at the local level, the king levied direct taxes on those who were engaged in commercial activities, uh, tax for cotton fields, tax for fish giving, and oil presser peace tax. Uh, there are many, many uh, diverse tax, you know, whose meanings uh, it's very difficult to ascertain. But, you know, I see these terms like cotton or fish and oil presser, you know, and they are all related to commercial activities and uh, they are taken from uh, outsiders. So I, I think we can assume that, you know, these taxes uh, were taken from uh, merchants and others who uh, were engaged in uh, production of commodities for uh, global uh, trade and th the king benefited a lot from taking tax from these people. Okay, so um, it is important to note that the state and the local community never functioned outside the vibrant market and commerce in 18th century Orissa. As part of the process of state formation from the late 16th to 18th centuries, communities have been opening up and monetary institutions have been introduced. With the penetration of the state apparatuses, uh, uh, the administrative technology, it, uh, uh, and the translation uh, uh, of the uh, local products into uh, cowrie terms, um, they became open to the market. I just want to quickly mention that uh, we heard that the Philippines have a very um, risky agriculture. It's the same with India. Uh, we, uh, it very much depends on the rainfall uh, annually, whether they will have good harvest or not. And the system of entitlements was a way of sharing risk as well, because they were expressed in cowrie terms. Uh, they will uh, share the, sa uh, the same amount uh, uh, percentage-wise uh, to different people. So uh, this was a very clever way of um, sharing risk as well as controlling the price of uh, the uh, rice to a certain extent, of course, you know, uh, because uh, a product of a certain uh, field is defined as 15 uh, kahanas, for example, 15 kahanas. And then, of course, we don't know the actual market price, but you know, I think this played a certain role uh, in uh, controlling in the uh, less production period, maybe, the, uh, the price of rice per k kg uh, increased, you know, in this way. Okay, so uh, there, was, uh, there were outsiders who connected local communities and the markets. I have already talked about, uh, about it, so I'll skip it. And, uh, okay, so uh, um, 
I just want to uh, reconfirm that uh, my argument is that there were interrelationships between the vibrant monetary economy and the development of administrative technology, as well as concurrency between the local community and the market economy in 19th century Orissa. Okay, so conclusion. So firstly, yes, uh, about the idea of currency circuit, I think uh, we can uh, confirm that this idea uh, has an explanatory value in uh, uh, talking about, uh, discussing about uh, uh, early modern Indian uh, market exchanges. Uh, so each circuit route uh, connected money, people, and things. And that each circuit remained distinct while being linked to other uh, circuit route. Conclusion two, and uh, money as a unit of calculation making non-commodities measurable. I'm saying non-commodities, I think it is important that uh, making things measurable doesn't make things commodities uh, uh, always. There are you know, cases like in this uh, um, the gift between the king and the subject or the, the distribution of entitlement or a marriage gift, they were given in money. So they were measurable, but yet they were gifts. So uh, measurability and being gift uh, did not really contradict with um, each other. So this is a kind of one, um, um, how do I say, complementary aspect to Kuroda Sand's formulation. And uh, again, conclusion three is related. So importance of money as gift, measurable, but not means of market exchange. It was more about uh, creating um, um, uh, social, political relationships. And because money was used as gift in tax, even in tax, it was uh, 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 bills of exchange and bookkeeping could not replace money because uh, you needed a thing as a gift. So silver, giving silver coins in for new regnal year ritual was very important. You can't say, oh, I have sent uh, uh, the money by bills of exchange to the king. You know, that <laughs> would not uh, uh, work. And, uh, okay, so I have already talked about this, conclusion four. And so I like to say, um, if we take uh, the social factors uh, seriously, I think we have to uh, take into account the kind of social relationships more seriously uh, than we have done uh, in economic uh, history. So, uh, of course, uh, Kroza-san's uh, quadru quadruple is uh, very uh, useful for comparative purposes, but in order to really understand, I don't think we can generalize you know, in that uh, uh, kind of uh, formula an anymore. I, I think we have to really sh uh, describe the interconnectivity interconnect between politics, economics, <coughs> and society, and how money functioned in each uh, that organic uh, 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 form. So uh, with uh, actually uh, Sugihara Kaoru Sensei-san, uh, some of may probably know, he's an economic historian. We are uh, trying to uh, develop uh, multiple paths of development in the world. And uh, I'm trying to suggest that there is a South Asian path of development, which is a diversity-driven uh, path in contrast to uh, the European uh, path or the East Eastern uh, path. Uh, and. Uh, in this South Asian uh, path, uh, the, uh, the diverse uh, 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 currency circuits uh, worked very well with the diverse social groups, uh, namely caste and other religious groups uh, in India. And then also with uh, uh, different social organizations um, being uh, concurrent uh, together, uh, politics, political organization of kingdom, and then local uh, uh, community and market. They are distinct social organizations, but connected with each other, with money. Okay, so I just want to uh, uh, talk about the implications lastly. So I like to emphasize that there was hybrid network of market and non-market institutions connected through money, bills of exchange, bookkeeping, keeping and uh, valuables as sometimes gifts, sometimes as money. So we have to go beyond the binaries of commodity versus gift or impersonal and personal or, and also monetary versus non-monetary. 
So money made things measurable, yes. But aspects of choice or freedom in Kurosan's term and duty or certainty in Kurosan's term intermingled with each other in different degrees in all transactions. Uh, having money does not mean you are uh, free of all duties or all trans uh, relationships. It's a relative thing, yes, relatively free. But yet again, um, in gift exchange, uh, like in a uh, system of entitlements, for example, you are relatively free of uh, personal relationships, but you are still embedded in community relationships. So there are different degrees of uh, you know, these uh, aspects of choice and duty. So the question really is how to understand the two sides of money. Uh, you know Hart, uh, Keith's uh, um, argument about two uh, sides of uh, a coin. Uh, you know, uh, he says uh, one side represents the state, another side the market. But I would like to uh, say one aspect the market value and another side the memory of relationships or memory bank of relationships. You know. uh, and so money always have this dual aspect of uh, freeing oneself by, by uh, you know, saying, okay, this exchange amounts to this market value on the one hand. But again, money also works as a memory of relationships. We, yesterday we talked about how uh, banknotes were with numbers and you had to trace the relationships of trust, etc. cetera. So uh, money, again, is really uh, a, a, ma a memory bank of social relationships. So you are bound always by the social relationships which this particular money represents. Okay, and I think uh, so. So uh, about cross and paper again, um, provisions of currency could enhance people to conduct exchanges with a higher degree of freedom. Um, yes, but also he says social relationships and market transactions are seamlessly mingled, and I think it is this aspect uh, that we have to uh, uh, carefully uh, research upon and uh, I'll take up. So then, if they are seamlessly mingled, how do they connect with each other? And I believe that there are idiosyncratic forms in which uh, social relationships and monetary relationships are uh, uh, mingled with each other, and that particular forms represent a particular uh, path of uh, uh, particular path of development in uh, uh, different regions of the world. Thank you very much.